Welcome to The Loop Podcast, where we are transforming education in plastic surgery since 2020. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Loop Podcast. I'm Brian Basiritarani, and I'll be going over breast augmentation and some high-yield pearls for the in-service. We will try to highlight some key points from previous in-service exams to help guide with this review. If you're watching us on YouTube, follow along for citations and illustrations. Having said that, this is just more of a supplement or an adjunct to your studying, and it's not meant to be comprehensive. Today, I have with me one of my good friends and co-fellow at UIC, Dr. Eddie Daniele. Welcome to the podcast. Why don't you go tell us about yourself? Hey, everyone. So I'm Eddie. I've known Brian for about a year and a half now. Before starting my plastic surgery fellowship out here in Chicago, I completed my general surgery residency in Texas Tech University out in Lubbock, Texas. I think today we're going to be starting with breast augmentation and mastopexy. All right, let's fire it up. So first we'll get started with some normal breast measurements. All right, so normal breast measurements include the nipple to nipple distance, and that's usually 19 to 21 centimeters, the midclavicular to nipple distance, usually around 21 centimeters, sternal notch to nipple distance, again, also 21 centimeters. The IMF to nipple distance is typically seven to eight centimeters. And uh, put in another way, the bottom of the areola to the IMF is about five to six centimeters. The areola diameter is anywhere from 35 to 45 millimeters. And another important measurement is the base width. The base width is the size or the width of the breast measured, which will determine the size of the implant. This is important to ensure that the width of the implant will fit within the confines of the tissue framework. The ideal breast has about 45% of the breast volume in the superior pole and 55% of the breast in the inferior pole with a natural slope in the upper pole, and the nipple is usually at the apex of the mound with a slightly upturned angle. It's a really good article from the Journal of Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgery from 2012 analyzing the ideal breast. And in that study, they used 100 models to define the aesthetic pleasing breast. Interestingly enough, this was actually a question that popped up on the in-service. Let's move on. Uh, Eddie, what is the blood supply to the nipple and how is it affected during uh, breast augmentation? So nipple areolar complex blood supply. So there's a perforating branch of internal mammary artery, the lateral thoracic artery, thoracodorsal artery, intercostal perforators, and thoracoacromial artery, and of course, the subdermal plexus. Subglandular breast augmentation disrupts thoracoacromial perforators through the muscle. And there's a high incidence of wound healing issues. Subpectoral augmentation maintains these perforators. Now let's talk about everyone's favorite topic, embryology, and what can go wrong during development. Brian, you want to take this one? Sure, my pleasure. Let's start with uh, breast tissue. Breast tissue is a modified sweat gland that results from ingrowth of the ectoderm with about 15 to 20 breast buds. All but two usually undergo apoptosis, and the remaining two become breasts. At weeks five to seven, the mammary lines develop. Week eight, primary mammary bud proliferates and invaginates. At week 20, they continue to lengthen and arborize into buds of breasts. Next, let's talk about tanner stages, and this is the stages of breast development. Tanner stage one is no breast glandular tissue. Tanner two is breast buds are palpable. And tanner 3 is when the breast is elevated beyond the areola. Tanner 4 is an increased breast size and contour and areola secondary mound. And tanner 5 is a grown adult breast. Eddie, do you want to talk about some of the other developmental issues with breast? Sure. So polymastia is an excess in breast tissue. It's considered ectopic when it's outside the milk line. The most common site for this is the dorsal thigh, and it can vary with the menstrual cycle. When we say accessory, that means it's within the milk line. There's cyclical pain and swelling coinciding with menses and milk production. The milk line is the venterolateral body wall from axilla to groin. The most common site of aberrancy here is in the axilla, followed by the groin. Polythelia is an excess nipple. An accessory nipple, most commonly along the mammary lines. This is the most common congenital breast deformity occurring in about 2% of the population. Brian, what are some other developmental problems that can occur with the breast? So you can have hypoplasia, and there's uh, several different flavors of that. You can have amastia, which is having no nipple and no breast. You can have something called athelia, which is no nipple, but you may have breast tissue, and that's usually associated with renal abnormalities. 
you can have something called amasia, where you have no breast gland, but the nipple is present. Moving on, you can have inverted nipples, and that's the failure of the mammary pit to elevate above the skin level. And usually when this is found in infancy, you just observe. Yeah, Brian, that's very high yield, too. They always ask a question regarding mastia, athelia, and amasia, just to confuse everyone. They've definitely been on previous tests before, so make sure you remember these. Yeah, that's a good point. A couple of other things that are usually coming up, I think last year this was a question about anterior thoracic hypoplasia and the difference between that and Poland syndrome. Anterior thoracic hypoplasia is hypoplasia of the breast, superiorly placed nipple areola complex, but you do have a normal pectoralis muscle and you do have normal sternal position, no limb abnormalities or polydactyly like you'd see in Poland syndrome. Poland syndrome is a little different because you have absent pectoral muscle without pectus or costosternal attachments. So you will see that deformity clinically. You will see an absence of the anterior axillary fold, and that's a very common finding. And usually it's tested. Poland syndrome is also associated with preaxial or radial polydactyly, although it doesn't always. And then one other thing we'll touch on is synastia. That's when one breast touches the midline. Some of the risks associated with that include large prosthesis, multiple operations, chest wall deformity, and subpectoral placement of implants. And as we all know, when we're in the operating room, you don't want to dissect out too medially. That's the no-go zone. So let's move on to another very common breast condition known as tuberous breast or constricted breast. Eddie, you want to touch on that? Sure. Let's talk about tuberous breasts. So some parameters that are highlighted in a tuberous breast is breast hypoplasia, constricted and elevated inframammary fold, and herniation of breast tissue into the nipple areolar complex. The distance from the nipple to IMF is short, and the lower pole is constricted with the lower foot plate with limited skin laxity. All these factors make it challenging to achieve a natural looking breast with breast implants. There's a higher risk of double bubble post augmentation. You have to minimize with radial release of lower pole through a periareolar incision. Brian, what are some other surgical considerations? For surgical approach to tuberous breast, some people advocate a periareolar approach and to decrease the size of the areola. The key is to undermine in a subcute plane to the desired IMF. Typically, the IMF is high and you need to lower the fold. Another very important aspect of surgery is to perform radial scoring and divide the breast parenchyma within the dissection. You also want to put the implant in the dual plane. Dual plane is ideal for tuberous or constricted breasts since the lower pole of the breast is the most constricted part and the dual plane places the most stretch in that area. Also, it's important to recognize that doing radial scoring in the breast parenchyma will invariably thin out the breast and can risk the implants to show and have risk of rippling. In cases of severe tuberous breast and or if the patient wants to be very big, a two-stage approach with tissue expanders should be considered. If the lower pole is very constricted and the IMF is too high, it will be very challenging to achieve an ideal aesthetic outcome in one stage, and that's due to the lack of skin distensibility. Again, there's a good paper from PRS delineating the differences of severity of tuberous breast and the best ways to address it surgically. All right, let's move on to my personal favorite topic, primary aesthetic breast augmentation. So, fun fact, you have to be 22 years old for a silicone prosthetic. There is a high risk of reoperation, somewhere around 25%. Hey, Brian, what's the most common reason for reoperation? Size change. Great. So for mastopexy augmentation, the most common complication and outcome is a lifetime need for reoperation. Some risk factors for dissatisfaction, other than size discrepancies, is a higher grades of ptosis and mastopexy at the same time. Mastopexy augmentation has an increased risk of nipple necrosis, especially if the implant is greater than 350 cc's. For evaluation, base width is the most important factor in choosing implant size and often dictates where to start for operative planning. An upper pole skin pinch of less than two centimeters means no subglandular implant, and you should really stick to a muscular coverage. Dual plane, if there's minimal ptosis and can use for primary augmentation. What are some complications associated with breast augmentation? So one of the feared complications is capsular contraction. It's usually about 10% or so, depending on what studies you read. There's the Baker classification of capsular contracture. We'll go over that. So Baker 1 is where the breasts are soft, the implants are not palpable, and it appears normal. Baker 2 is breast solid, 
implant is palpable but not visible and appears normal. Baker 3 is the breast is hard, implant is palpable and visible and appears abnormal. And a Baker 4 is breast is hard, deformed and painful, the implant is palpable and clearly visible and it's pretty obvious that there's an abnormality. This is multifactorial, but the leading theory is that there's a subclinical infection, possibly with a biofilm formation. One other thing to consider is, for example, if a patient has post-op cellulitis that resolves with PL antibiotics, you know, there's reason to believe that the patient has recovered from an infection, the patient may be colonized and then healed, the patient may be at a higher risk of capsular contracture. Implant size is not directly associated with increased risk of capsular contracture. Textured implants are associated with a decreased risk. Also putting the implant in a submuscular dual plane is associated with a lower risk of capsular contracture as opposed to subglandular. In terms of treatment, treatment is basically dictated by the severity. So for mild capsular contracture, for a Baker II or something, no evidence that a surgical bra or massage post-op will decrease risk of CAPCON, but a lot of people do it anyway. In terms of other supportive measures, Montelukast is a leukotriene antagonist that can inhibit the inflammatory cascade. It may be considered in low-grade capsular contracture, but there's no real consensus on that, and there's you know mixed studies on the effectiveness of preventing capsular contracture with that. Now we'll get into the treatment of moderate to severe cases, or Baker classification three and four, which is operate. It has been long accepted that a Baker 3 or 4 required a total capsulectomy and had superior results over partial capsulectomy and capsulotomy. The theory behind this was that if there was capsular contracture secondary to infection and biofilm formation, it is necessary to remove the capsule in its entirety in order to remove the source. However, a recent meta-analysis by Rorick in 2016 showed that site change, implant exchange, and addition of acellular dermal matrix were the only aspects of treatment most definitively associated with a lower capsular contracture rate. Total capsulectomy in a submuscular placed implant can be dangerous since trying to remove the posterior wall capsule from the chest wall can risk a pneumothorax for the patient. Implant removal and total capsulectomy remains the standard of care for all cases of ALCL. At this point, you need to determine if the capsule is your enemy or your friend. If it is your enemy and it is going to cause a problem with the aesthetic results, then you want to get rid of it. If it is going to be your friend and can help you with the inferior pole support augmenting your results, then you can leave parts of it behind. Now I'll further discuss a neosubpectoral pocket. This is a pocket deep to the pectoralis major but superficial to the anterior capsule, which you leave completely intact. You obliterate the old pocket by suturing, suturing it down to prevent the risk of seroma. You then place your new implant superficial to the old anterior capsule, but deep to the pectoralis major muscle. There is a really good paper here in ASJ written by Maxwell and Gabriel from 2008, which has some really, really good pictures. Yeah, that's a pretty good paper. I think it illustrates your points very nicely. It's very difficult to, to kind of close your eyes and imagine this, so definitely look up the paper and get a better idea of it. So what are some of the other complications associated with primary breast augmentation? So late seroma can be seen in patients who have breast augmentation, and that can be concerning for ALCL. Anytime you have a late seroma, you want to perform an ultrasound to see if there's fluid around the implant, and if so, you want to aspirate it and send it cytometry, CD30 T cell surface protein, and cytology and gram stain. Not only do you want to rule out ALCL, but you want to rule out the cause of infection and treat it appropriately. Implant infections secondary to non tuberculum mycobacterium include Mycobacterium fortitum. It's associated with implants of any kind. Signs and symptoms include erythema, serous drainage. And in the OR, you may encounter exuberant granulation tissue with a turbid, odorless fluid. The gram stain will be negative. The treatment of choice is to remove the implant and start Cipro and Bactrim for six months. Nowadays, people are getting fat grafting to the breast. There are some complications with that. Fat grafting usually leads to about 50 to 60% retention rate. You can risk getting calcifications. You can get lipid cysts. Rarely you can get clustered microcalcifications, suspicious of cancer, but that's not very common. The calcifications can look round, punctate, diffuse, eggshell, 
dystrophic or coarse popcorn. And those are usually most likely benign. The characteristics on mammography that's concerning include clustered, branching, or granular. Eddie, what are some other complications that can potentially result after breast augmentation? Galacteria. So this is milky drainage from nipples. It's not very clear what leads to this, but it's observed to occur more often in Paris women and a combination of factors that stimulate suckling. Also, change in innervation of the chest wall and nipple areolar complex can increase this risk. Factors that lead to galacteria include the pressure of the breast implant pressing on the tissue and interruption of the intercostal nerves. There is no relationship between position of the implant, i.e. subpectoral, subglandular, dual plane, or subfascial. There also is no difference between implant type, i.e. saline versus silicone, and postoperative galacteria. The treatment for this is bromocryptine, which is a dopamine receptor agonist that inhibits prolactin secretion, which is responsible for milk production. Dosage is titrated to the response. A galactoseal is a benign breast cyst containing breast milk. This occurs in women of childbearing age, active lactation, and recent pregnancy. It's thought to be secondary to a blocked duct. Some suggest that periareolar incisions can increase the risk of ductal obstruction, thus leading to a galactoseal. The treatment, again, is bromocryptine. Brian, what is this snoopy nose or waterfall deformity? That's a good question. That's when the totic breast hangs off an implant after breast augmentation. This can happen if the implant was placed a long time ago and the breast developed ptosis afterwards, or if the patient developed capsular contracture and the breasts have become more ptotic over time with that. Gravity always wins. The best way to correct that is to do a mastopexy, lift the breast tissue up onto the breast implant, and depending how old the implants are, the patient may be a candidate for implant exchange. Sometimes this can be accentuated or even caused primarily due to capsular contracture, not just ptosis over time. In that case, you may need to treat for capsular contracture, which uh, Eddie alluded to before, pocket change, etc. All right, now let's say you don't have the complications. What are some of the protocols for screening to detect silent rupture? Great question. And it's a very, very high yield topic, both for the in-service as well as clinical practice. And I have a feeling it's going to be even higher yield this year since there were some changes over the last few months in the screening protocols. So screening for silicone implants, it was taught that for asymptomatic patients with a breast implant, an MRI should be performed three years after the initial implant was placed and every two years after that. Now, September 2020, the FDA has made an update. For asymptomatic patients, the first ultrasound or magnetic resident imaging should be performed at five to six years postoperatively and then two to three years thereafter. If someone has a trauma and a positive seatbelt sign, you must obtain an MRI to rule out ductal carcinoma in the line of contracture. Now, although ultrasound can detect the capsule contracture, MRI is more definitive. MRI is the most sensitive and specific method for detecting silent rupture of a silicone breast implant. A positive Linguini sign or a teardrop sign is seen on MRI. Yeah, there's a good paper in a radiology journal showing this, and I would recommend for any listeners or viewers to take a look at that paper. Very easily testable topic and may show up on the in-service. Eddie, what are some other features on MRI? So there's multiple low signal curvilinear lines on MRI. That's this Linguini sign. Physical exam will not be very telling. For example, if one breast had a rupture and the other did not, you would not be able to tell only based on your clinical exam. In mammography, the Eklund view, which is posterior superior displacement of the implant with anterior displacement of the breast after both saline and silicone implant ruptures. All right, now let's talk about all the different kinds of implants. This is a huge topic in itself, so we'll try not to get too much into the weeds and give you the high yield facts for the in-service. So let's start with the basics, silicone and saline. Let's start with silicon. The advantages of silicon include that it's much lighter, it less, causes less tissue stretch, feels more natural, and leads to less rippling when compared to saline. And that's usually related to the fill volume. The disadvantage to silicon is that it's more difficult to detect rupture. You usually need an MRI to detect that. For saline, the, one of the biggest advantages is that you can immediately detect a rupture because the breast will be completely deflated and all the saline will be resorbed by the body. The disadvantage is that saline implants are heavier. It causes more tissue stretch. It feels firmer and it's less natural. 
can lead to higher rates of rupture if it's underfilled. If it's overfilled, it can lead to scalloped edges and it has a higher leak rate than silicone. Silicone has different cohesivity, and what that means exactly is how firm the implant is. Cohesivity is determined by the length of the silicone strands and cross-linking. This is also referred to G prime. The more cohesive, the more cross-linked the implant is, and the higher the G prime of the implant is, and therefore the stiffer or firmer the implant is. This is also known as form stable. More cohesive implants decrease rippling since it's more stiff, which can lead to less capsular contracture. Rippling related to the fill of the implant, which is 95% in highly cohesive and 85% in others. Gel fracture and delamination of the implant shell is much less in implants that are more form stable. Eddie, do you want to talk more about the shell of the implants? Sure. So texturizing implants originated with polyurethane foam to coat implants as it was found to decrease capsular contracture rates. Since the 1991 FDA moratorium of breast implants, polyurethane never returned to the U.S., although it is still very popular throughout the rest of the world. Polyurethane is problematic because it is difficult and dangerous to remove during explantation, and there is some thought that it may be carcinogenic. Nowadays, texturing is done through special processes, and different brands have different methods. Brian, what are the two most common techniques for texturing? So there's the salt loss technique and there's the polyurethane foam technique. For the salt pour technique, salt granules are pressed to the silicone before the silicone dries. Once the silicone with the salt granules dry, the salt is then brushed off, leaving behind salt pores that are the size of the salt granule. For the polyurethane foam technique, you press uncured silicone onto a polyurethane foam to create a stamped surface with a comparable configuration of salt pores. This, however, usually leads to less texturing than salt pore technique. Those are the two most commonly used ways to texture implants, although there are newer ways to do so. We won't get into that here, but if you're interested, you can look it up. You can also determine the degree of texturing or roughness by the size of the granules and the process in which the implant is textured. The more rough the implant shell is, the more this is implicated as the potential cause of ALCL. The pores can be a nidus for macrophages to hang out, leading to chronic inflammation and biofilm formation after implantation. Another important consideration is friction. Although friction can be beneficial as it can decrease incidence of malposition, the contact and wear and tear over time can cause inflammation. Macrotextured devices have been thought to increase the inflammatory response more than microtextured devices. As a result, as of July 2019, the FDA voluntarily recalled all of allergen textured devices with biocell, and that's because of the association with breast implants associated ALCL. Interestingly enough, there was a paper out in the 70s from the University of Chicago, I think by Ferguson, who started talking about pore sizes and roughness and devices and the tumorigenesis of that. So I thought that was a pretty interesting paper, and that was a very long time ago. So the pathophysiology is still not 100% known, but you know this has been described well in the past. What are some other features of textured implants, and how does it compare to smooth implants, Eddie? So textured implants result in a thicker, more inflammatory capsular tissue, and this suggests reduced capsular contracture rates. There's a higher friction coefficient, which causes an, a decreased incidence of malposition, but this does not include malrotation in shaped textured implants. It can also be associated with late onset seromas, outwards of greater than a year postoperatively. You should send for cytology and IHC stains for CD30 and cytokeratin to rule out, but majority are benign. Underfilled, round, silicone textured implants in subglandular position show more rippling compared to silicone smooth and overall saline has more rippling. In comparison of capsular contracture, subglandular textured implants have a decreased rate. A subpectorally placed textured implant has no change in capsular contracture, just as a smooth subpectoral implant has no changes in capsular contracture. For seroma formation, a textured implant has an increased risk of seroma formation. Now for projection and volume, for a given volume, higher profile implants have a narrower base width. Moving on, let's talk about location of the implant. Sure, so you can place the implant subpectorally, dual plane, subglandular, or subfascial. So for subpectoral implant placement, there is a risk of animation deformity, 
and there's also a risk of lateral displacement of the implant. In order to correct this, you need to remove the implant and insert the implant into a subglandular plane. If the patient develops ptosis after a submuscular or subpectoral implant, the patient will get a snoopy nose deformity or a waterfall deformity, where essentially the breast tissue looks like it's falling off the implant. There is less risk of capsular contracture compared to the subglandular plane, so those are the pros and cons of subpec. For dual plane, there's dual plane one, two, and three. And essentially, you're going to place the implant beneath the pectoralis major muscle, but for a dual plane one, you're going to divide the pectoralis major muscle along the IMF. For dual plane two, you're going to do the same thing as dual plane one, but you're also going to dissect the breast parenchyma off the muscle up to the inferior portion of the nipple areolar complex. For dual plane three, you're going to do the same thing as dual plane two, except you're going to extend that parenchymal di dissection up to the superior part of the nipple areolar complex. And this allows the breast to redrape over the implant and give a more natural look. There's also subglandular implant placement. You need to make sure that you have adequate soft tissue coverage and skin thickness on clinical exam. And usually a skin thickness of two centimeters or greater is needed. Otherwise, you'll have visible rippling and you don't want that. Nobody wants that. Some advantages to subglandular is that it can be helpful if patients have some ptosis and they need a mastopexy. It's an easier recovery. There's no animation deformity. The disadvantage is that there's a high risk of capsular contracture. It can obstruct breast tissue on mammography, although it does not affect cancer detection. Another important point is to identify where the IMF is supposed to be. And if the IMF is too high, it may need to be lowered in order to prevent a double bubble deformity. And lastly, there's the subfascial plane, which is very similar to a subglandular plane, except you're just gonna go just beneath the pectoralis major fascia. Some people think that this is a little bit more of a challenging dissection, but people who do it say that it's better because you get that extra layer of fascia separating it from the breast tissue and theoretically can have a lower capsular contracture rate. And so that's a lot on breast augmentation. Let's move on to mastopexy now. Breast is a very high yield topic and we've covered this in other sections, but it's worth reviewing again. Eddie, you wanna talk about sensation and a little bit of the blood supply? Sure, so first we'll talk about sensation. The innervation of the nipple areolar complex comes from the third and fourth anterior cutaneous intercostals, with the fourth being dominant. The third is located at the 8 to 11 o'clock position, and the fourth located at the 1 to 4 o'clock position. The dominant is the deep fourth lateral cutaneous branches in pectoralis fascia. They then sharply turn anterior 90 degrees to innervate the nipple areolar complex posteriorly. The superficial anterior cutaneous branch that runs superficially from medial aspect to innervate the nipple areolar complex at the medial border. Preserve best if you avoid resections at the base and avoid skin incisions in the medial aspect, only preserved on the medial nipple areolar complex pedicle. For vascular supply to the subclavian and axillary artery at the lateral border of the first rib. We touch on this a lot in other podcast, so we'll move ahead a little bit now, and we'll talk about some indications for mastopexy. Ryan? Sure. So typically, when women become pregnant, their breasts get bigger, and that's because of the increased number and area of differentiated um, lobules secondary to estrogen. This is useful for breastfeeding their newborn after they give birth. After some time, however, they experience something called involutional changes, which is basically a reversal of the enlargement of their breasts due to less circulating estrogen, and thus decrease in the number and area of differentiated lobules. This can also be seen in menopause as a result of less circulating estrogen. In addition to this, Cooper's ligaments of the breast become attenuated and the skin becomes more elastic, further contributing to the breast sagging. Patients present with stretch marks, deflated breasts, and tapotic breasts. There are several different strategies to address that surgically. The first is a circumareolar or donut mastopexy. And the most common complication of doing that is the widening of the areola. One way to do it is the wagon wheel technique with a Gore-Tex suture popularized by Hammond. This is appropriate for patients who have grade one ptosis and don't need a significant breast lift or mastopexy. Typically can't do this for anyone that needs more than three to four centimeters of a lift. And even then that's a stretch. So if they have a lot of ptosis, is really not the best, but if you need just a modest breast lift, this is an appropriate technique. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum is a wise pattern, mastopexy, 
And the most common complication is a boxy breast post-op. This is appropriate for grade three ptosis, excess lower pull skin, and patients with a long nipple to IMF distance. If the areolar is very large, you need to make a wide angle of divergence for the vertical limb, and that can lead to a lower pull deformity when you try to bring the skin together. So wise pattern is usually patients who have really long pendulous breasts, almost like a breast reduction, except you're not really taking out breast tissue, you're just really taking out more of the skin excess. And then there's the vertical mass apexy. The most common complication is the increased nipple to IMF distance. You can do the vertical mass apexy based on several different pedicles. You can do superior, central, depends on your preference. If the nipple to IMF distance is greater than 10 centimeters, that might be too long of a distance to only do a vertical, and you may need to have a horizontal component in order to reduce the skin distance. Eddie, what are some pros and cons for single stage augpexy? So, some advantages are immediate improved upper pole projection, one less surgery, and the anesthetic risk. Some disadvantages are it's harder to predict outcome, higher complication and revision rates, longer operative times. Of these, a need for revision is the biggest risk. Indications for a delayed mastopexy after removal of implants is moving the nipple greater than four centimeters, a breast mound pinch less than four centimeters, and smoking. Now, while we're on the topic, let's classify ptosis a little bit. There are four different grades of ptosis. Grade one is the nipple is at the level of the IMF, but above the lower gland contour. Grade two, or moderate, the nipple is below the IMF and above the lower gland contour. Grade three is severe, and the nipple is below the IMF and at the lower gland contour. Type four is pseudotosis, and the nipple is above the IMF, but most of the breast is below the IMF. After massive weight loss, patients can be seen with grade three ptosis, medialization of the nipple areolar complex, lateral breast mound, lateral axillary fat roll that extends to the back, a lowered inframammary fold, and a more deflated and flattened upper pole. Now let's talk a little bit about ALCL. It's a very, very hot topic in plastic surgery, and it's very, very testable. Yes, it definitely is becoming increasingly more popular on the in-service exam. So let's talk a little bit about that. Although it's rare, it's usually between 1 in 1,000 or 1 in 30,000. It's a peripheral T-cell lymphoma that is found in patients with textured implants or in patients who have had a history of textured implants, although there has not been a report of a smooth-only implant causing ALCL. Aggressive texturing or macro texturing is thought to be associated with a higher risk of breast implant associated with ALCL, and that's related to the increased surface area and therefore higher number of bacteria that can latch onto the device. This is the biggest known factor for ALCL. The first case of ALCL was reported in 1996, and cases have been continually increasing. ASPS recognizes 200 cases in the U.S. and 500 worldwide. Numbers are constantly being updated, but there is a registry for providers to report breast implant associated with ALCL2, and it's not just for plastic surgeons, for all kinds of doctors, so primary care physicians and all different specialties. It usually has a non-aggressive course, and it's amenable to implant removal and a total capsulectomy. This is the only indication for a mandatory total capsulectomy. Now, not only is it a plastic surgery hot topic, but it is, again, very high yield for the in-service. And again, you're going to take many tests over the course of your life, but what's really important is taking care of patients. And it's extremely relevant in real life when talking to patients about breast augmentation. If your patient does not bring this up to you, you should mention it in your informed consent process, regardless of the type of implant you plan to use. And the most common presentation for breast implant associated ALCL is a late seroma, usually appearing greater than one year. And as a result, all late seromas should be worked up to rule out ALCL. The workup requires an ultrasound first to look at the fluid collection, then aspiration of the seroma to be set for cytologic evaluation of fluid and flow cytometry. Again, that's CD30 T-cell surface protein, which is a tumor marker for ALCL. The treatment is based on the NCCN guidelines for BIA ALCL, complete removal of fluid, capsule, and implant on the affected side. More advanced cases may require chemo, radiation therapy, and a possible lymph node dissection.
All right. That pretty much wraps up ALCL, and that will finish today's podcast on breast implants and mastopexy. We hope you guys enjoyed it. Eddie, do you have any other comments? No, thanks for tuning in. All right. Well, that does it for today. That was a big topic. I hope that was helpful. And if you like our podcast, spread the word. Tell a friend. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram at The Loop Podcast to get in the loop. Catch you next time.